Well, hello everyone and welcome again to Painless Universal Conversation with myself and Walsh. Today we'll be having a conversation about overcoming the gut pain and finding your joy. My guest today is Dr. Tim Spector. He is a professor of genetic epidemiology and director of the Twin UK Registrar at the King's College in London and has recently been elected to the prestigious fellowship of the Academic of Medical Sciences. He founded a Twin UK Twin Registrar of 13,000 twins, which is the richest collection of genotype and phenotype information worldwide. He held the prestigious European Research Council Senior Investigator Awards and is an NIHR Senior Investigator. Our conversation will focus on his latest book, Spoon Fed, Why Nearly Everything We've Been Taught About Food Is Wrong. He's also the scientific co-founder of Soy, a company that to look into your genotype on, on your relationship with food, what works for you and what not, what you should be eating and what you should take away from your diet. Super excited to have this conversation because in times like these is where we really need to listen and pay attention to why we want to and why what we're eating is not what is to working and why sometimes it's not working. What can we do to improve our lifestyle, to live healthier and happier, overcome the challenges of inflammatory dietary problem? This conversation is truly for you because I believe when you listen to what we have to say, what Dr. Tim has to say about the journey of his findings, you will look at food differently. Meet my amazing guest, Dr. Tim, as he shares his story. Well, hello everyone and welcome again to Painless Universal Conversation with myself, and Welsh. Today's conversation is really focused on looking at all things diets. Have you ever thought about you're in a room with your sister or your brother or your friends and you're eating the exact same thing? One of you's losing weight, the other still not losing any weight, probably be putting more and more weight on. And you always ask yourself, why is this happening? Why am I going through this pain of going through this enormous amount of diet and nothing is happening? Well, today's conversation is just for you. Dr. Tim will be explaining this journey. His book, which is just his latest book, I think everyone should just get a copy of it, Spoon Fed, Why Nearly Everything We've Been Taught About Food Is Wrong. You've listened to my introduction, so you can see know a little bit about him, but listen to this conversation now. Dr. Tim, how are you? I'm marvellous. Oh, Thank wonderful. you very much. I am truly delighted to have you here. I mean, anyone who looks at your work, I was looking at your YouTube channel where you were telling us what to eat, and you then brought out some sandwiches and said, I have stopped normally binging on this during my busy hours at work. And I'll be asking you about that because normally when we're so busy, we get consumed without, we don't have time. So we look for the closest thing just to, you know, get ourselves going. So we asked me about how have you changed your lifestyle, but we'll get to that later. Before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about who are you? Um, it's a question I often ask myself because I'm quite hard to define really. Um, I'm, I'm someone who's uh, enthusiastic, very inquisitive, um, uh, quite entrepreneurial, doesn't like get stuck in a rut and uh, probably annoy a lot of people who are trying to sort of be my boss. And uh, it's been a theme really throughout my life. Uh, when um, I first uh, went to medical school, um, I was quite lazy and uh, did the minimum amount of work possible and as much socializing as possible. And it wasn't until uh, I, I did a project as a medical student uh, on epidemiology and had a very good teacher who really got me into this idea of sort of doing detective work in medicine. And um, I did a little project on uh, diet and cancers of, of the pancreas and found that just working myself, going away in a library, um, doing correlations between things was one of the most exciting things I'd done. And so this was a bit of a shock for me, my late lazy medical student self. And was a bit of a wake up. So gosh, you know, I can do things myself and actually prefer doing it to the rote learning lectures, this kind of stuff that everyone was doing. So I really liked being a bit different. 
and and I, I actually wrote up, wrote up that paper in the Lancet, uh, which was uh, quite unusual. Um, and it, it, although that it later turned out that it was all rubbish that uh, that research it um, said that coffee was bad for you. It um, it really prompted my academic career. So I went through medicine and was always looking to do things within medicine that were on the research side that I could that I could do. And, and I trained as a rheumatologist, which is bone, a bone and joint doctor, really to make, give myself a stable career. Uh, and then as I did that and I got my uh, consultant post, I, I did more and more research. And in that time, I took time off between, I went and uh, worked in Belgium for a year as a, a doctor. So I saw other kinds of medical systems, learned to speak French, and then came back and did a, a master's degree in epidemiology, like a, a year out. And that, that also gave me these tools to, to study anything. And so then I really had this epidemiology idea of studying popular, which is the study of populations. You know, why, uh, so I was studying things like arthritis. Why do people get arthritis? Is it related to menopause or hormone therapy? And did big started this idea of doing big data collections. And that, that really stayed with me um, until I moved to my current place, which was St. Thomas's Hospital uh, in the early 90s, and then started um, the twin, uh, this, uh, my twin research program. And that allowed me uh, to do everything I wanted. I, I could use the same methods and uh, really answer pretty much any question that, that uh, I had on a common disease. You know, was it nature? Was it nurture? You know, was smoking involved? Was alcohol involved? You know, how heritable is supporting a football team? Um, you know, is it genetic to like or dislike Mr. Bean? Um, I could... I could have fun with it and at the same time answer very serious questions. And so with that amazing cohort, I built up a team around it. We were amazing. And we now have about 15,000 twins on that register that, you know, we've uh, produced about 800 papers or so answering many of these big questions in science. You know, firstly, how, is it genetic or is it environmental? And then, um, how important are things like diet, exercise, smoking, and many of these things at the time were quite unusual. So, yeah. you know, people didn't really care about back pain. They just thought that was old age. And we just discovered actually back pain was more genetic than breast cancer. And things like this that sort of changed people's mindset about diseases. And, mm -hmm. and I've really, in the last uh, 10 years, I've sort of shifted focus a bit, but still use this very simple method of, of uh, using twins to uh, sort, sort this out. That is so phenomenal. And I'm going to take you back now um, to your Brussels day, because you were born and raised in North, um, North London. And, and you've always had this excitement, even by your description about life, you said, and when you found a project, a, a detective kind of work, then you got excited about work, you got excited about doing what you were doing. And for example, you started your career as a junior doctor on a medic world in Brussels. What is fascinating about this is that you did not know how to speak French at that time, and you had to learn to speak French to all your patients. Having never spoken it, uh, spoken a word of French before, describe your early days. What gave you that confidence that you know I'm in this room, I'm a young doctor, but I'm going to make this work? Tell me what your early days were like. Well, I'd sort of convinced myself that I did speak French because I I used to go to French restaurants and uh, I could read the menu and uh, order the wine, and. I'd, I'd been on a, a few holidays and exchanges, so I could speak some French. Mm. I did do French at school, but as you know, you know, uh, English speaking French lessons are not very good. Yeah. Um, and I, I passed the, I had an interview where I was interviewed by a big panel of professors and they had one doctor who had a holiday home in France who interviewed me. And I, I managed to convince him I could speak more French than he could. Um, 
but it, it was a bit of a shock because I thought, I thought, oh, well, I'm sure they'll give me, you know, a sort of adjustment period of a month to get up to speed and this would be fine. And they didn't. I, on day one, I was just uh, shown my, shown to the ward with uh, 12 very sick cardiac patients and told to get on with it. Um, but uh, yeah, so my confidence got me a certain level and then yeah, yeah. the rest was hard sweat and um, relying on some very nice patients who are used to, in Belgium, they're used to people speaking uh, Dutch or French. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they were a little bit more considerate of foreigners than they would be in you know, London or New York. Uh, if you if you tried to do that and everything that's you know has a latin word in medicine is the same and so that were some common a lot of common words in medicine more than in the spoken word so um but it was a very very tough first month i must say um uh, and i my brain was just uh, overload i used to, to sleep for 10 hours a night i just couldn't uh, stay awake but uh basically i i you know i i was sort of competent at a month and then uh, at three months I was pretty fluent with this immersion uh, yeah but uh, I probably wouldn't do it now <laughs> um, no, I can imagine so um, then but you, then you escaped um, a helicopter a heli ski accident and I think that I can't imagine what that did to you when you were going through that bit running from a burning helicopter on the Georgia Russia border what lesson did you learn when you came there that near death experience? Because that's that sometimes could be an eye opener. You could think you could think to yourself, oh my goodness, I I have to rethink the way I live life. Or that could be about, oh my gosh, I might, I might take more risks. I, if I could get through this, there's nothing else in life I should worry about. What was it to you? Um, it was strangely a positive experience because I I, mean, I realized we were lucky, you know, when you look at the statistics, I think 50% of all helicopter crashes are fatal. Um, so it's not like a, you know, a crash landing on a plane when you go back and, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, most sort of, uh, you could greater chance of surviving or in a, in a car crash or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so you certainly felt incredibly vulnerable uh, up there at the top of the mountain with you know the helicopter turned upside down so i realized weirdly i i, I sort of shut down and would, was super calm and i obviously i hadn't been in that situation before i didn't know where i'd completely panic you know wouldn't be able to move my legs or do anything and i was the last one out of the helicopter because i was on the bottom couldn't see what was going on and i just went into a sort of meditative trance it was kind of weird and uh you know and and as we got out uh i wasn't hurt everyone had cushioned me <laughs> above me but um and then I, I had the time to actually look back and take a, a video of the burning helicopter because I thought no one would believe me and um uh I was I was really surprised that I was wasn't completely petrified and but that I think it made me realize that you know life can end very quickly and you've got to do the stuff you enjoy because you don't know what's what's around the corner so actually for me it was a positive experience and um and you know and the next year i did get back in a helicopter um it wasn't a pleasant experience i must say um particularly when they landed which was you know the same scenario we were in, i was in before but um you know i got over it and realized you know i can't you can't live your life in a cocoon but you've got to make sure that you maximize it and um everyone has a limited time we don't know when it when it's going to come so you know do the stuff you enjoy and don't don't do the stuff you don't want to do that was my that was my new philosophy in that time but i hope i don't repeat it oh yeah no that's amazing because some some uh, sometimes it takes us something to really happen to us for us to realize the beauty of life and uh, we're only given this one chance in this world and it's either we take advantage of it and make it the best life ever and you just did that clearly at um, your team at king's college hospital um in since 1992 you enrolled 15,000 set of identical twins in the twins uk study i mean that is a massive challenge for anyone to think of to grasp that number that you could find 
that amount of people that are identical twins to go into this study. What led you on this path to think that this is something that will make a difference because this has made a lot of difference in terms of everything you do today. Even you've, you've now utilized it in, your, in the planning of your, the diet as well. What, what made you on this path to go on this big embankment of this twins UK studies? Well, I just, um, I'd finished doing my, uh, my medical thesis and which was on hormones, menopause and arthritis. And uh, I was, and my boss at the time had moved up north and he said, do I want to come with him to Manchester to continue that work? And um, I said, no, I, I don't want to move. And also, you know, I need to do my own thing that's different. And so I, I really spent three months looking for something to do that was different um, and, and unique. And I've never been one who wants to do something, you know, a Me Too study that's slightly better than someone else's. I always want to do something different, take more of a risk. And so I spent three months actually going around the country asking people what they thought I should do um and bouncing ideas off and uh, it was when i got to a, a pub in oxford and i met a, a geneticist called brian sykes and we had a few beers and at the end of that uh, beery session uh, we'd come up with the idea of doing twins uh, because suddenly so realized there was hardly anyone in the uk doing any twin work and uh, so I, I really went away with that idea and um said okay let's let's get the the you know the the only adult twin registry in the uk and and set it up and that was my vision and luckily i had a few key members of my team that have been with been working with me already for the last five years shared that vision and with some great you know i realized that i had, had a certain skill with the media and wasn't frightened of making appeals and so Using the UK media and TV, we managed to get uh, these numbers, in, you know, in a big way, and suddenly it, it snowballed, and um, it, here we are, amazingly, you know, nearly thirty years later, um, with this this amazing resource that has, has produced so much. Wow. What What was some of the lessons you learned from doing this work that about twins and the genetic makeup of twins? Well, twins are a, an amazing natural experiment that you could only get in a, you know, a mouse a laboratory full of mice because uh, they're like human breeding experiments without the breeding. And essentially, we had identical twins who share all their genes in every part of their body, and we compared them with their fraternal, dizygotic, non-identical twins uh, who share 50% of their, their genes. And so you have these two groups all the time, which act as a control for each other. And so it's a, it's a superb way of controlling for, uh, you know, both sets of twins, whether they're identical or not, have the same parents, the same uh, time of birth. They usually go to the same school. They were given the same food. They're in the same environment up to the age of 18. Mm -hmm. And so anything that happens differently to them is sort of controlled for those factors and so it allows you really then to hone in on those key factors that might be that make one get disease the other one not get the disease make it different and and by comparing the two groups if if the identical twins are more similar for something than the non-identical ones you say that is the effect of genes and so you can directly measure the effect of genes because everything else is the same mm. and that that was this marvelous appeal to me of, of this sort of universal research toolkit uh, that are these uh, you know we mustn't forget they're humans and yeah true to my success is their altruistic wish to help you know we never paid them they did this all for supporting science and the nhs and and, and that that's rare out, outside the uk to do that as well so that was the the basis of this and and of course, as, as we learn more about genetics and, and twins, which you know, has definitely progressed in, the, in this 30 years, where we now know that, uh, you know, whereas they identical twins 
share 100%, near virtually 100% of their genes. They will always have a few mutations that are different. And they have epigenetic changes, which are different, which means the genes get switched on and on, on and off differently. And, you know, I, I got more and more interested in why identical twins are more different than you would expect. You know, why one gets cancer and the other one doesn't. You know, if all their life is so similar, why, why, you know, do they end up different at all? You know, it's, it's a really big question. And that, that, that line of thinking took me to a number of different areas. Firstly, this epigenetics, which I studied for about five years when it first got on the scene, um, but realized that those chemical signals, the technology is hard to measure them and, and it, the effects are small. And that led me on to you know, my current true love, uh, the microbiome, yeah. uh, which is this whole area of gut health where identical twins have really different gut microbes. And that alone could explain many of these differences we see in uh, disease or personality or, or traits in these otherwise you know, genetic clones. And I think that's, that's to me has been this, this uh, key insight and that if identical twins are different, just think about us non-twins, differences between you and I yeah. uh, in, in how we respond to our environment, our food and how that affects our risk of disease and health. That's really great. Um, uh, I mean, great work you did there because I mean, I get, it gets me thinking, especially now you've taken it on to the diet. What's up, what, what's up with our gut? Which is something you wrote a book about this, the diet myth. What led you on that path to now, from what lessons you've learned from the like, twin sets to now taking on to the book? What, what lessons did you learn from that book, the first one you wrote, the diet myth? Well, I, my book before the diet myth was something called Identically Different, oh. which was all about these insights about why identical twins are different. And we studied everything from uh, why they might be different for you know, obesity, why they might be different for personality, depression, anxiety. But we also looked at things like religion, um, political beliefs, uh, looked at um, uh, sexuality, so uh, not only you know, number of sexual partners, but also um, heterosexuality, homosexuality, and saw these differences in identical twins. And that was mainly about epigenetics. And just as I was finishing the book, the very final day, I, I, I went to a lecture in the US about uh, this new thing I'd never heard of, the microbiome. And uh, so I added about a paragraph just before I went to the printers. And in a way that uh, led me to then do the next book, The Diet Myth, which was all about making that paragraph in into a, a full book. And I went away as I do with all my books for about a three or four month sabbatical to actually learn the subject from scratch. Um, most people write books on only the things that they've been studying for the last 20 years. Uh, I've tended to do books uh, on new areas so that I become an expert on it rather than um, just giving you my life's history That's on it because I think many of these areas like particularly like nutrition or the gut my you know a fresh insight actually without all the baggage of the dogma and the bad teachings of the past are actually useful. And I can really be independent. I'm not aligned to, you know, the anti-fat people or the anti-sugar people or the keto people or whatever. You can just go in and say, this is how I see it. And then it's up for people to judge uh, whether they trust me on that. And what about your next, um, the, the new book that just come out? I think it's come out this year, 2022. There's, um, you said, Third book, Spoon Fed. What? So spoon, yeah, so Spoon Fed, um, it wasn't actually intended to be uh, a book on its own, um, but it, 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 it came about really, uh, I've been writing for the last six years this massive book, um, 
which uh, will eventually come out. <laughs> but in that, I, I discovered there are all these uh, quite shocking revelations about food. Um, so the diet myth is all about was all about knocking some of these preconceptions about diets and introducing people to the microbiome. And spoon fed was really uh, working out why why had we got this misinformation? You know, who led us astray about calories, and who told us that exercise made you lose weight? Who told us that um, you know low fat products and low fat yogurt are good for you? And what was that study based on? You know, who said it's better to snack regularly rather than gorge? Who said it you should never miss breakfast? So all these things I, I, I took apart as 30 chapters and realized either that the original science was flawed and then picked up the role, the role of, of the food companies uh, who were actually propagating these stories so they could sell more product. And it really sort of, as I got into it, it became more of a, a clear pattern across many areas where the lack of funding in you for universities for nutrition have been replaced by the influence of the food companies who are some of the biggest lobbyists you know whether it's in Westminster or uh, in Washington or across across the globe in stopping you know new laws against uh, foods and, and keeping ultra processed food uh, cheap and available and with false labels on it so the more I did it the sort of angrier I got and uh, it became a book on its own. Uh, and I think it, it really demonstrates where we've gone wrong and why, we've, why we continue to be fooled mm -hmm. by food labels. And uh, this, also the idea that the other theme was, again, pers personalizing nutrition, that the guidelines that the food companies love to sell their product, you know, the five a day, the third, 30% of this or whatever it is, so they can have stickers on the, on this rubbish food, all comes from this general idea that uh, someone in government can invent some guidelines that every man and woman in the, in, in the country has to then uh, abide by, which, yeah. you know, the 2000 calories for women. And I showed this is complete nonsense. And, and so that really led to this this idea of personalized nutrition and this coincided with the work I've been doing on the on the company I co-founded Zoe to really disprove for once and for all that you know everybody should be having this perfect standard diet uh, in this counted out calories uh, in, a, in, a, in a farcical um, fantasy world and that's why we're all overweight and unhealthy and so in a way, that was the, the two themes, personalized nutrition and why we've got it all wrong and why you know, there's so many uh, fallacies in nutrition. No, I have to ask you that question because this is really important part of the conversation today is about what we eat. I think a lot of people are struggling with that concept because they're, you know, you're very right there. We've all seen the label. And we, we think, oh, if it says this, it must be good for us. If it, say, if it says this, I, I've, I've gone to numerous people and people say, oh, have you looked at it? Are you sure that's, um, read it, read it. And I always say to people, I, I like to eat when and listen to when, the way my body responds to food. I don't eat based on what someone says I should eat. I eat based on the way my body responds to me. Because some things, as much as people might say it might be very good for me, I put it in my body, it's just, nah not good for me so i tend to eat what my how the body responds to food so when we look at the general public now um, because this is a big big issue it is a, a big issue for the food company because they need to make, keep doing what they do to make us buy more and more food it's a big com uh, issue for a lot of younger people even people in general people who want to lose weight who are not finding a method to, to lose weight how can diet improve our health the health of our gut what can we do? How can we use diet to do this? Well, I think that the first thing is to understand the concept, and that is mm. that, you know, we've got this new organ in our bodies, the gut microbiome, which we, you know, only really become into public attention in the last five years, I guess. 
and scientifically only really the last 10 years understanding really what it does yeah. so it's like we've discovered a new liver or um, kidneys uh, but probably you know even I thought more important because this is the link between what we eat and our health and our immune system so a microbiome is a, is a chemical factory which produces thousands of chemicals every day which go to regulating our immune system and our health, fighting cancer, dementia, aging, metabolism, um, and you know whether we're happy or sad by pumping out not only vitamins, but also neurochemicals, you know, like serotonin. So understanding that makes you really change your idea of how you eat, uh, in, as opposed to it's just fuel <laughs> through this, you know, this very simplistic idea that uh, food companies and government want to make it uh, and, and realize that it's much more subtle than that. And so therefore, everyone needs to really eat, uh, firstly, in a personalized way, but secondly, in a way that is really gut friendly and enables as many gut microbes to flourish in your gut as possible, because the diversity is crucial. And the more diverse the microbes, the more chemicals they produce, the better the regulation of your immune system and everything else. So there are a number of sort of key rules, if you like. I mean, it's obviously more complicated than just uh, four or five rules, but everyone likes to have uh, four or five bullet points. And uh, I've got a few I can share. One is uh, eat a diverse range of plants every week. And so it's we, we've gone for the magic number of try to achieve over 30 different plants, which doesn't include potatoes and chips, um, but it does include things like nuts and seeds and herbs. So it's not as hard as you think, particularly if you get, like I do, bags of mixed nuts and seeds and sprinkle it you know, on my salads or, or uh, breakfast. Um, the second is to go for plants that have a high uh, content of, of something that the, the microbes like to eat uh, is fuel for them called polyphenols and these are natural defense chemicals in many good healthy plants that give them the bright colors or the bright or the sharp tastes or the tannins and these are things in nuts and berries uh, they're also in things you wouldn't expect like dark chocolate uh, coffee green tea uh, olive oil, uh, red wine. Mm. And then you've got fermented foods, which are known to many people that, you know, most people know yogurt, but it's not just yogurt. Um, it's um, cheese, artisan cheese, not the stuff you get out of a, a tin or a, um, or a craft slice, but a, a real artisan good cheese that goes moldy. Uh, that's a source of microbes. Then you've got what I call the four Ks, um, which your four K rations, which is uh, kefir or kefir as it's known in America, which is fermented milk. You've got kombucha, which is fermented tea. You've got kimchi, which is a, a Korean dish, which is a mix of spicy garlic, cabbage, onions, uh, and chilies. And you've got, of course, traditional Central Eastern European kraut, sauerkraut, which is just fermented cabbage. And the key is to have at least one of those in a small amount every day to uh, sort of energize your gut microbes. And the final rule really is to, is to avoid the stuff that really hurts your gut microbes. And that is uh, as much as possible ultra processed foods, which includes artificial sweeteners and um, uh, the chemicals and you know you can tell an ultra processed food pretty easily by the label uh, you won't understand those ingredients you won't have them in your kitchen and usually have over 10 uh, ingredients and, and it's something that just never goes off um, so that they're, the, they're the four key rules on how to look after your gut microbes you I can go on I mean there's things about you know not snacking and leaving long intervals overnight so you rest your gut is another 
uh, key oh, tip. You mean not snacking at all and just so at night time you leave it for much longer, sort of gut gets yeah. to us. Something that's called, it's, just, it's a, an emerging area that's getting very popular in the US and is spread to Europe now, mm. uh, restricted time eating. Mm. So you try and have 14 hours overnight when you're not, not actually eating anything and your gut microbes can recover and reset and they have what happens in your gut because your microbes live their life a bit faster than we do they have sex and replicate and uh, die all often within an hour and so at night uh, when you run out of food you get different species come out who are like the cleaning division of your gut and they tidy everything away and they clean up your gut lining and they make it uh, most efficient. And that helps our metabolism and is generally beneficial. So people who eat late at night and early in the morning and might get up in the middle of the night for a snack uh, are really asking for trouble. So long periods when you're not eating and make sure you have you know, good proper meals is better than the, um, what we were all taught at school is, you know, eat little and often, don't overdo it, don't gorge. The opposite actually is true. And so if you are going to snack, make sure it's really close to your meal. I have to ask you uh, on that. What, when would you say the right time is, to, is um, to stop eating? Like when is it right to have your dinner? And after dinner, then you say, okay, let's just have some water so the, the gut can repair itself. When is the right time? I don't think there's any right or wrong answer. Um, I think you've got to listen to your body. Also depends where you live in the world. Um, if you live in uh, Scotland or in Scandinavia, you'll be having your, or in the Midwest of America, you'll be having your evening meal at 5.30, 6 p.m. Mm. So if you don't eat after that, it's quite easy. But many people in those areas often have a second <laughs> snack before going to bed. Um, whereas if you live in Spain or Greece, you'll be having your evening meal at 9.30, 10 p.m. So you can see how culture how plays a big role in this. Uh, a third of the, about a third of the world don't have breakfast. So that obviously helps them. Um, and so I think, it, I think everyone's going to work out for themselves what works for them. Absolutely. Uh, I find, you know, I tend to eat fairly late spend a fair bit of my time in Spain. So it's, uh, I have a more Mediterranean lifestyle. And so I find it easier to just skip breakfast in the morning, which gives me, mm. um, you know, two or three times a week, a longer overnight fast without really mm. uh, dramatically changing my, my setup. So I think everyone's got to work, think out what works for them the easiest and experiment. And I think that's one of the essence I try to instill in spoon fed is that because we're all different, we're going to find it, some people, you might find it really hard to skip breakfast. I would find it really hard to not eat after 6 p.m. Um, everyone has a different rhythm and we've got to start accepting that we're all unique and, you know, and, and my idea is just give people the tools to, to find that out for themselves, but uh, don't get it stuck in ruts just because that's the way you've been told to do it. Don't always eat the same food. Don't know what, you know, do, do change your meals around and see what works. That's true. Um, how can we get to change our mindset? Because I think mindset is everything with our relationship with food. When we talk about food, we want to, you've just said, uh, we should get into try and try different things and explore a little bit. How can we change our mindset to believe that this is possible, that we could actually eat different things and still be healthy? I think it's, it's realizing that you're not eating. Eating is not just a form of energy in, energy out. And fats are not uh, all bad. And carbs are not all bad. And so it's like sort of saying, Let's start with a blank slate and look at, you know, perhaps how our ancestors ate um, and realize that if we think of 
food as fuel for our microbiome, just like we would for our garden or our fish pond, uh, you put different stuff in there than if you're just going through routines and, and checking it. So I think it's, I think if, if you can teach people about the gut microbiome and about personalizing and how we're all unique, then I think people's mindset can change. And I think, you know, I do get people who have read Dark Myth and Spoon Fed and, you know, have said, you know, it's changed their lives and it's changed their, their family. And they do have now a completely different view on food and it, it really has helped them. And it, you know, it just helps you in your selection of food and you're, you realize you're not a slave to advertising campaigns or government posters and you don't have to do what everyone else does. Yes, absolutely. So this leads me to my, um, your company, the new app that's Zoe Limited, which grew out of your obsession for diet. Can you tell me a little bit about it and how is this helping changing the mindset and concept on the way we eat? So we set up Zoe uh, five years ago with uh, a couple of on, uh, internet entrepreneurs uh, who really understood artificial intelligence and pr prediction models. And uh, the key to the company was that rather than just spending money on marketing as most nutrition companies do, don't do any research, actually spent the first three years uh, doing the biggest nutrition study in the world. We studied uh, several thousand people in the UK and the US. In the UK, it was mostly twins, giving them all identical meals and seeing how their bloods and uh, urines and everything else and appetite and energy levels changed after those foods. We also, as well as we gave them uh, glucose monitors to stick on their arms, which last for two weeks and give you a readout of your blood sugar every five minutes. And we did blood prick testing to look at blood fats and inflammation. And importantly, we looked at their gut microbes uh, using the very latest uh, high density sequencing, which gives you something called the metagenome. And we put all this stuff together and we were able to firstly see that uh, there was a tenfold difference in how normal people respond to identical foods. So that's, that was a bit of a wow moment. Uh, we also saw identical twins responded very differently, which that the second wow moment. And we realized that lots of factors went into explaining this. And once you put in the microbiome, you put in some of the baseline bloods, you put in um, their exercise levels, their sleep levels, you could predict with you know, over 80% accuracy, how someone is gonna to respond to any food by doing this test on them. And so that's where we develop the, uh, the Zoe app, which gives you a, a score, personalized score of every food you can think of uh, that you might want to eat. So you can then plan your food choices by which foods agree with your, your own body, your own body's metabolism and will help your gut microbes. So it, it allows you to make choices, you know, and tell people, like for me, it told me I really should avoid bread um, and having starting with a high carb uh, bread or muesli breakfast was really the worst thing I could do. And so I've shifted to a, a yogurt and nut and uh, fruit breakfast. Um, it told me to give up sandwiches, as you mentioned uh, in the introduction. My you know, hospital sandwich at St. Thomas's Hospital for 10 years was the worst thing I could be eating. Uh, and substitute that for, you know, maybe even pasta was better than bread for me. And it also uh, allows people to uh, you know, come up with a, a plan that without thinking about calories at all, allows them to lose weight over over six weeks and uh, that is a is sustainable you know from for months and years because people aren't restricted that we're not saying anybody you can't have that you just say well don't have that too often have this uh, more as often as you like look at your scores they'll tell you what to do to reduce your sugar peaks to reduce your fat peaks 
and to keep your microbes happy. And that's, that, um, that plan has been now, we've been running that for over a year in the US very successfully. And uh, from April, it's gonna be available in the UK. And uh, you know, we've got lots of people queuing up to, uh, to test it out. And it, it's gonna keep evolving. So you know, it's science, so it's not perfect. And every, every three months, it's gonna get an update and keep getting better and better as we get more and more data from tens of thousands of people. So I think it's a very exciting sort of citizen science project that helps us all understand food, but also can help individuals uh, lose weight, get more energy, which is interesting that the thing that came out we weren't expecting, that's actually the number one mm. thing that people notice when they use the scores to pick their meals and they get less of these peaks and dips they get less hungry and they have more energy. And it's likely to have many other advantages down the line because the gut microbes are also imp improving. So uh, in, the, in the UK, I know the, um, the, the plan is coming out to the UK. Anyone who wants to sign up, how do they get on this program? How do they get in, in contact? Well, whichever country, whether in the US or the UK, it's uh, joinzoe.com okay. is the website and you can sign up for the wait list um, uh, in the UK, where there's still a lot of people waiting to go on, but we're, we're trying to ramp it up as we know who's you know really going to buy this, we can increase the numbers uh, considerably uh, once we get going. Uh, but it, it's it's been long, you know, it's been a long time coming to the UK, um, not helped by uh, you know COVID. COVID and not helped by Brexit and uh, all oh. these other things that. Uh, yeah. have made life difficult but uh it's it's finally here so I, I'm, I'm very happy and, and i'll be very excited to see how people get on with it before i let you go what does a typical breakfast include looks like for dr tim well i'll try to vary it <laughs> but if i'm short of time okay <laughs> if i'm short of time and inspiration um i get full fat yogurt um and i also add, add a shot of kefir to that. So it's a mix of kefir and yogurt, which is my fermented milk. I have a, a bowl of uh, mixed nuts and seeds, which contains about 10 different plants in there. And I sprinkle that on top. And I will then usually add some berries or fruit, whether it's currently there's lots of blackberries and raspberries around, so I'll add them. Otherwise it might be some blueberries. I, happy to use frozen ones as well. And, uh, or if I have something left over in the fruit bowl, um, I'll cut that up and eat that. And I wash it down with uh, a black coffee, which is also very high in fiber and uh, has lots of polyphenols and uh, is very healthy for you. And absolutely avoid, what I used to have is a, a glass of orange juice, which is worse for me than Coca-Cola. So that's my, if I'm my boring breakfast, um, if I'm in a hurry. No, no, um, honestly, absolutely. I think anyone who reads your book will get a kind of concept of what to do, how to protect themselves, how to look after themselves. If, and if they're lucky enough, they might get on this program coming out in the United Kingdom soon and to find out more about themselves. But I'm really honored that you took this time out because we could go on because there's so much more. I hope to have more have you next time to talk about the COVID because I see you also working on COVID as well. You're utilizing the data from the twin set to do more on the um, COVID, which is something I would love to talk to you about. But in the meantime, um, I can't thank you enough for this conversation because I really learned a lot about diet and what is required to help us understand more about nutrition, how to lose weight, if we are looking to lose weight, what is best for us. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure.